Great. So I will begin. So today I will touch base on the version ID. I did receive feedback from most of you, and I uh, thank you for that in advance. So uh, I'll discuss on that, and then I'll hand it over to Brian, and he'll discuss some more terminal terminology. Walk through the activity feed and to-do list feed as well. So this presentation will probably be the shortest we've had. Uh, so there'll be plenty of time for Q and A at the end. So based on your feedback, we decided during the beta pilot we would test using the test report ID. Uh, my team believes that this, the test report ID with combination of the product ID should maintain uniqueness uh, since products with the same product ID that may be manufactured at different locations should not be on the same test report. That's um, so that's what I learned from the last meeting. And um, and when I asked that question in the follow-up email, many of you stated that you would prefer to use a test report ID. I also hope that this will make things easy on your end to keep track of the certificate. And for clarification, when component part certificates are used, the test report ID can be used as a version ID for multiple certificates. Um, that doesn't negate the uniqueness factor because the two different product IDs using the two uh, the same test report ID would still have would still be unique. And lastly, for certificates with multiple labs, I would suggest list first the lab with the most citations and then use that test report ID. Uh, however, so this test report ID is not actually a required field um, for the for our citations or the CFR. So we'll make this optional, which also means that we will create a, a system generated ID that you could use instead. I think our developers will default to the test report ID. Uh, and if you agree to that as well, we would uh, you wouldn't have to provide a version ID. You, just use your test report ID from your certificate for the version number. And then, um, unless you specify, and then we'll override that with system generated ID. We haven't really decided on like how many digits that will be. Um, but uh, we'll update you on that in the future. And so I'll open it up right now for any questions, but we could hold off to the end after Brian presents. And once we develop some of the documentation, we'll clarify maybe a few more things around this, the, around the versioning ID and how to use the combination certifier product ID and test report ID together. So we'll get, that will be all prepared in a package later on once we get to the stage of onboarding all of you to test the system. And so today uh, I will be discussing activity feed and to the to do list under our analysis intelligence. Sorry. Um, so, just a little bit of preamble. Um, the, the screens and the flows that we're about to discuss, um, these arose out of the need to have some sort of notification based system within e filing. Um, there's a lot of different individuals who are doing a lot of different things within the system. Um, and there needs to be some level of visibility into activities taken on a product collection, certificate updates, things like that. So initially when we began developing, we were thinking of just a standard user inbox with all the notifications and all the things that have happened on a product collection uh, with red and unread statuses, the, you have the badges, you know, notice that there's a whole bunch of things, you look through them and you clear those notifications. And we ended up moving away from that uh, because we wanted to make sure all of the updates happening within a product collection were accessible to users, but we didn't want to require visibility on them to clear badges and deal with red and unread notifications. So we came up with the concepts uh, detailed here that we're gonna go into today. Um, the first being the activity feed, um, which internet parlance could also be referred to as a timeline of sorts, but it's uh, a reverse chronological list of recent actions taken on a specific product collection. So when you've updated certificates, when you've added new certificates, when you've added 
test data when a certificate has been attested to. Uh, these are all the sorts of things that are going to show up in that key. So you can scroll back very far. We haven't come up with the specific details yet. Um, now we could, we'll endlessly go back to the beginning of time or if there will be a limit to it. Um, but that's the basic function of it that they'll go into the details. Um, similarly, the to do list. Um, this is, these are actions that do require a user to do something, to complete something. So if you know, within a, a given company's workflow, someone needs to provide attestation for a certificate to complete it or get that final version ID. That's a relatively high profile item. So short of developing a messaging system where a user can ping someone inside the application and say, hey, can you do this for me? Uh, we came up with this concept of the to-do list, which is every user is gonna have a to-do list and any items that are system calculates need to be handled or can be handled by that user based on time appear in that context and then clear when they've been clear automatically once they've been dealt with. So that's what we're going to be digging into today. So the activity fee. Um, like I said, it's a collection a fee to recent events in any product collection that you have access to. New entries, entry updates, uh, imports that would occur through either a CSV upload or an API import. Um, those will also show. Um, a user's role is going to determine what shows up in that feed. Um, the administrators of a business account may see user related activities like John Doe was invited to X or Y product collection. Um, editor roles don't need to see the individual user management activities, right? So there's, there's going to be a little bit of automatic filtration that happens based on what your role is within the product collection. Um, the feed will be filterable. Um, so the type of event that you're looking for, if you're looking for um, a, a batch of products that were imported um, by CSV last week, um, we want you to be able to filter down that activity feed to only show um, batch imports, to only show uh, imports from CSV, you know, from CSV uploads versus API uploads, things like that, um, to really make it easier to track down any events that are looking for. Similarly, when you're finding these events, when you're looking back to try and find something that was done before, it's usually going to be to follow up on some activity, to finish a product entry, or to review it. Um, so these events in the feed are going to be linked. So if 14 products were imported to your product collection two days ago, if you click that 14 products hyperlink, it's going to show you which 14 products those were, and it's going to follow up actions. So hopefully that's pretty clear. I've got a quick uh, click through flow to show to sort of demonstrate this in action. And just a reminder, these screens are obviously subject to change due to mockups. Um, development work is ongoing, so some things may be tweaked. They may look a little bit different in the final form, but this is to really give you an idea of what we're envisioning for the flow. So as you think through this, if there are any things you're missing. Feel like aren't accounted for here that you may need to do or actions you may need to take. Um, that's why we want to introduce this to the so voice those concerns or questions in the uh, So, top of activity. Right here in the upper right. Yes. So, this is our basic uh, concept for the feed. It's you know, a window that can pop out, it's scrollable, and you've got a lot of core information right there. In the feed about things that have happened specifically to this product collection. Um, there will be feeds available um, from your user dashboard that are not limited to a specific product collection. If you're a user that has access to multiple product collections, um, you will have the ability to see all activities across them and then filter that down to specific collections on different screens. But if you've navigated to a specific product collection and you pop open that feed, it's going to show you that product collection. So it's a context aware. The filters, I don't know, where's the four product entries? Hover over four product entries. Yep, so yeah, if you click that, so that's, you can see that that's the filtering mechanism I was talking about, um, one of them, where, you know, based on when that happened and where it came from, we want you to be able to narrow down, you know, find the, the events that have taken place that you're looking for, and then easily get insight into what happened. So you can see those are the four products, that tag that appeared, CSV import with the date. 
that gives you insight into what the filter is that's going to be applied to your collection. Um, if you need changes to all four of those or any one of those products, you'd be able to do that. So, yes. so that clears it. You're just back to a filter product. Um, the filters, I think, a little twirl down. Arrow next to all right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this was another the filter mechanism I was talking about where if you click on an event type, I believe it should show. There we go. Um, so this user is, it's mocked up here, is an administrator because they have insights into user-based events or updates to affiliated trade parties. So I believe product entry. Um, and then the secondary context menu comes up. Or, Trying to see only new entry, new product entries, updates to entries that already existed, or entry removal. So I think you can check. Yep. So this filters the list down. So now all the activity feeds only showing new product entries. Okay. So if you only wanted to see um, entries made through the API, you'd be able to addition further filter it down and then get inside into those products, product updates, and. So that's sort of the quick overview. I think it's a really handy tool um, for basically just engaging with the all the, the mass amounts of data. Sort of. Um, so, like I said, the to-do list um, displays updates that require direct action. I think it will automatically be removed. When you're invited to collaborate on a product collection, uh, the system really does need you to accept or reject that invitation. It just ends. Once you drop things like that. So, invitations that you've received, um, those require an action. So, from the to-do list on your dashboard, you'll be able to you can click that notification, view the invitation, accept or reject it, and add items to it. Or similarly, if you're an administrator, there are products in your collection that are legal decontestation status, which is a precursor to them actually being filed it using reference message sets. Um, that's an action that we don't want to linger indefinitely. It's going to hold people up. Have 27 products that are awaiting attestation, there's going to be an entry in the to-do list. Seven products that are awaiting attestation, click on it, it's going to show you those products. You can view them, approve some of them, and lower the number, you can approve all, that sort of thing. So if you slide it. Um, so this one, I believe, is shorter. I don't think you can pick up all of the entries, but that first invite, you know, yep, it's going to take accepted. See that product collection that you were in, that this user was invited to now shows the product collection summary screen down there below. They can jump into it, start working, and start rolling. Four product entries are waiting at the station. See that took this user to right to those four products. The filter is to show products awaiting at the station. They'll be able to complete that step from return to their dashboard. That item would be clear as well. It would only pop back up once new items in the collection to that pending at the station status. So that's sort of the quick, quick and dirty overview of how we're envisioning these tools functioning. Like I said, if you guys can think of anything that we may not have accounted for in terms of that you're familiar with, updates that you need to make, delegation responsibility, you're going to let us know. 
hopefully that was pretty cool. So if you're on the line, if you have anything to add, feel free to chime in. Yeah. Um, so can you go back to the previous screen for one second? Um, I think okay. if, if you hit the, yeah. So you notice in here a couple of items we have in the to-do list also um, this concept of expiring soon and expired. So we're, we're talking internally, uh, you know, uh, a little bit about what exactly these concepts mean since certificates don't exactly expire. They're good forever as long as there's product that was manufactured in that time frame. But, but there is a need as long as you're continuing to manufacture, manufacture a product to recertify every year. So it's mostly a terminology thing. Perhaps it should be, you know, pending recertification or you know needs recertification soon, something like that. Um, um, but again, there's this idea that we're we want to help you <clears throat> as the business account administrator or even a product collection administrator to know when you've got uh, products in your collection that appear to be nearing a need for updating the certifications and or have their certifications have lapsed. Um, and we're also talking about uh, providing the opportunity to ignore them because there are, there are cases or Perhaps on an individual uh, product, ignore that uh, if you're not planning on manufacturing any further, you don't need to uh, recertify with CPSC, obviously. So, um, so those are a couple of other contexts where we're trying, where we're, we're thinking this to do list can come in handy to help you to manage, uh, you know, manage the flow of uh, information that you need to provide into into our the system here. So. It's important to point out that as well. Um, are there any comments or questions from the group? So, yeah. essentially, you're done with the content. So, any questions or concerns about the activity feed or, or the to do list? Take no questions. That's positive that we covered everything that we do with these three concepts. Let me go back to this slide on the components for discussion. So we've covered a lot of this, but of course, we still have to address um, some other things like under business intelligence, we have the report. Under certificate data management, we do still have to cover attestation. I believe we still have to cover the managing party and trade party parties, and then API as well on the all the way to the right. So those are like the final ones. And this today was a light topic because we we are still developing content for the rest of it and kind of resolving uh, some questions that we have internally before we present it all to you. But in two weeks' time, we'll be able to cover some of these other topics as well. And then, well, now, I mean, next steps, there really isn't any next steps for you. Uh, next steps for me and my team at CPSC is to finalize updates to the CATER. I've taken a lot, all of your content, all your feedback, and I very much appreciate it. It's been very helpful. Um, especially on finding my new typos and errors, but also addressing some bigger issues. I've taken some questions to CBP to clarify. I've gone through many sections that it can tear and just clarify content to make it uh, e easier to follow. And if you to flip to a page, you have all your answers. I typically with a document like this, the answer may be in there, but it may not be in the section you're looking at precisely. So I did copy and paste some lines around um, and I made some clarifications to certain PG lines. But to that point, I don't actually have these questions written on these slides. Uh, we were internally talking about the record keeper, the individual who is responsible for ma managing the test report. So that is actually, 
a requirement on the certificate, but we haven't included that in e-filing. But we thought um, that we would prefer to test it for the beta pilot. And the reason being is that that is the final data element from the certificate that's not included in e-filing. And if we were to include it, then that could inform our future rulemaking around 16 CFR 1110 and help us decide um, whether an e-file certificate meets the requirements for a certificate accompanying shipment. And I know that was a question that was brought up from several of you. So we'll consider it as an option, but I do have a question that you could pipe up now or email me later uh, as to who, who um, internally or within your trade partners is responsible is actually managing the test report. Who is that record keeper? Is it you, the importer? Do you rely on your broker to keep that or the manufacturer or your testing lab? We consider that those four are probably the most likely options. I think most likely it's the importer or broker based on my experience here at CPSC. However, we want to consider if there are other record keepers, like a third party that we haven't thought of that you may hire to manage your test report. And furthermore, if it is one of the options I did just suggest, that makes it easy to include in the UI because then we would just have like a, a checkbox or a drop down feature to identify who is the record keeper because we already we will be ready collecting that data on who is the importer, which of course is the business account holder. Uh, the broker information is we received from the entry summary, and then of course, lab and manufacturers provided. So we hope that's not too much of a lift, that would just be a drop down or checkbox. And so I just wanted to get your feedback if um, any of you wanna pipe in and let, let me know uh, who primarily maintains those test, re test reports. And you could even just type it into the chat field. Well, okay. Well, I will follow up with an email uh, detailing these questions. Um, this was kind of last minute, and I don't. I know I was not prepared and did not have a slide for this. I do want to say our next IT DAC meeting will be March 9th. I do have to postpone it till 3:30 p.m. Um, I do apologize if that's an inconvenience for you, but there is a conflict that I have and. I, and I figured postponing it to 3.30 is not a big change. So we do have one comp from that. Yeah, Justin, you want to read it off? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just mentioned that IKEA has a central unit which keeps test reports. They are responsible for the importer. So in that case, it would be the importer, or in this case, you know, the certifier slash business account. Holder. Uh, that has a comment. Um, she said from our side, the Macy's is, respons is the responsible party, but we hold all certifications on the third party laboratory database. Okay, so in that case, it's the laboratory which we would know of. It's just the Okay. I will follow up with an email with this, these slides, the, this reporting, of course, because there's some people who have not, are not here. Um, and I'll, I'll ask for that feedback. Uh, IKEA, Curtis mentioned that IKEA Sweden is not the IOR. I understand. So IOR, um, you're, that you're addressing a different point. We will, as part of, in the beta pilot, like, let me take a step back. I know CBP has a definition for IOR, which not, does not always align with what we consider as the importer. So we will clarify that in the future, but if for the purposes of the beta pilot, it is because you are the participant, you are the one responsible for the data and certifying. So 
we shouldn't run into that issue. But when it comes to the future rulemaking, we have to clarify that difference between IOR and Yeah. 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 Understood. Well, I'm going to stop this recording. Thank you for your time. Um, I'll stay on for a few more moments if you'd like to speak to me. Thank you.